Happy Thursday. <laughs> um, drop in the chat where you're calling from. You can write it in the chat box. Let us know if uh, this is your first event, if this is your third event, or if this is your 27th event. And since today's topic is travel hacking, I'd love to know what level of travel hacker you are. Are you an expert? Or are you here because Matt's going to teach us everything we need to know? Just uh, fill that chat box up and we'll give a minute or so for everyone to figure out Zoom and to file on in. <laughs> So for those of you that don't know, my name is Leah. I am the chapter leader for the LA chapter of the Nomadic Network. I have my own travel podcast called Ticket to Anywhere, and I am an event manager. So I usually help Erica, Matt, and the Nomadic Network run these events. And today I will be your host and moderator. So just want to run through a quick few things before we get started and as everyone is coming in. You guys all see my screen okay? Wonderful. All right. So everyone, welcome. We are the Nomadic Network. We're a global network of travel enthusiasts that are supporting and helping one another to travel for longer, cheaper, faster, better. Well, not faster, actually. <laughs> we enjoy slow travel. So these community events, you know, we were in 22 cities around the world before COVID-19 hit. We were doing them in person, um, and then everything went online. So we have a great travel community online now. So we're doing virtual events, Oops. all the virtual events, and we're giving you, you know, great topics, moving online, and um, we are here so that, you know, you guys can fulfill your travel dreams and connect with one another. So we appreciate you being here. If you found us through someone else or something else, let us know in the chat as well. Just a few little housekeeping rules. Oops, if I can, there we go. Things to keep in mind. You can turn your camera on. We love to see your beautiful faces. We always love it when people are more engaged and we love seeing facial expressions or you can leave it off. Um, you'll be muted for the duration of the presentation while Matt is teaching us everything he knows and we'll have a Q&A following the presentation. So be sure to drop your questions in the chat. Use the chat to connect, to talk to others, share your relevant personal experiences. I think this will be a great one to tell us how you've travel hacked. And please, if you can, start your question with question in the chat. Replays are available to all Patreon members and you'll see the link there. I'll explain a little bit about Patreon after um, Matt's presentation in Q&A as well. And we're here to learn and fulfill your wanderlust, especially since we're all pretty much at home. We're not traveling internationally right now. So as always, our speakers are doing this out of the kindness of their heart and they're sharing their knowledge and passion with you. So we're super happy to have Matt himself here today. And a small intro, Matt has been um, travel hacking for over a decade. So, you know, hopefully today he's gonna let us know how you can save hundreds and thousands on accommodations, flights, and everything else. So without further ado, Matt, I will turn the floor over to you. Hey everybody, how's it going? Can you hear me? <clears throat> Just type in the chat, you can hear me. Um, excited to be here. Cool, people can hear me. Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, share screen. Okay, can everyone see this? Where's, where's the chat now? I lost the chat. Oh, here's the chat widget. All right, cool. So if you have any um, questions, you know, save them for the end. Um, and Leah will sort of keep track of them for me and I will talk. I've seen the pictures here. I really miss those gray suede shoes I have in the center. Just can't wear nice shoes anymore, you know? Don't leave my house hardly ever. Also, if anyone hasn't read that book, The One Thing, I highly recommend it. It's really good. <clears throat> uh, and so in today's talk, we'll, we'll go over some uh, travel hacking tips. Um, some will be 
pretty beginner. So if you're, the first couple of slides are pretty basic. So if you're a pro at this, um, you probably won't get much out of the first slides, but you know, maybe the other ones. And then we'll talk about points and, and ways to, to get points, especially when we're not traveling. Uh, and a couple of things I've, I found over the last few months. Um, and then we'll take questions and that will be the hour. So, um, yeah. So to begin, if I can figure out, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at PowerPoints. This is why Eric is around. Um, so you can summarize travel hacking as the, the art of getting and collecting uh, points and miles uh, from different travel programs and then gaming the system to get free or severely cheap travel. Um, you know, legally, um, obviously, this is like a big cat and mouse game between the, the banks, folks like myself, and all the travel companies in the world. This isn't some hidden secret. I mean, we're not like, guys, this is a secret nobody else knows about, right? The, the banks and the companies, they all know about this. They, they encourage it because, you know, they make money off the points and the interactions and um, everything. So, you know, everyone's just playing giant whack-a-mole. Like we're trying to find the loopholes and their rules and ex exploit them. They close a loophole, but inadvertently open a loophole. And then we go in that way and keep trying to get points. And, you know, it's, I mean, the banks sponsor all these like travel hacking conferences. Like they, they, everyone gets in um, on this game. So when someone says they're a travel hacker, they are a loyalty obsessed travel fanatic who is all about getting points and miles and, and free travel. Because the best kind of travel is free after all, right? Um, you know, we don't want to pay for it. And I think, you know, the common misconception when it comes to travel hacking is that it is very complicated. Uh, it takes a lot of money and <clears throat> a lot of time. And, and that's not necessarily true. I, for example, am a terrible travel hacker in comparison to my friends who do way more things than I do. And I just wonder where they get the time of the day. But, you know, I mean, I know people who go resell stuff on Amazon um, and they literally get pallets of stuff shipped to their house and then spend their weekend watching movies um, and reselling it on Amazon. And you get like one or two percent um, profit from this. Uh, but, you know, even if you don't, you get all this miles. I'm like, you spend a whole weekend doing this? They're like, yeah, what else am I going to do? I'm like, I can think of a million other things to do. But you just get some people who just love to play the game. Uh, and then me, I, I like to do a little bit more than the bare minimum. Um, but I just do it for free travel. I just want to cover my travel expenses. Um, and, then, and then that's enough for me. And I think, you know, there are many ways to enter into the travel hacking space. You can just do a little bit, you can do a lot, or you can just go a full, like, fanatic. Um, it all depends on how much you like it. Um, and so I, I just want to use this definition because I tend to use these words interchangeably, and Erica always yells at me. Um, <clears throat> miles are what airlines give you, points are what you get from pretty much everywhere else. Um, so, um, if I say points or miles, um, this is the difference, but kind of use them interchangeably. Uh, but all we're doing is we're collecting something that we can redeem for points, uh, later on, uh, for free travel later on. Uh, I see lots of questions here about the chase card. Sorry, the capital one card. Um, all right. So I got to minimize some of these screens. So how do loyalty programs work? Uh, they originally started in the 80s by American Airlines uh, as a way to incentivize people to stick um, with one company. They offer you special perks, discounts, upgrades, freebies, uh, lounge access, uh, added points per dollar spent, um, really anything that gets you to avoid switching to another airline 
right? Because, um, you know, when you think about it, right? I mean, how they all kind of suck, right? I mean, if you, you know, I mean, American United, um, Spirit, you know, Delta, so, you know, I mean, they're all like, they're getting you from point A to B in a very uncomfortable way these days now, right? So to avoid getting people to just go with the cheapest price, they offer the, these random perks. And I mean, you think about it, humans are just, they love that idea, right? Of getting rewarded for doing something. I mean, think about going to your local sandwich shop and they give you that little card and you get the 10th one free, right? How often do we just go when we're like, oh, I'm, I'm only four away from getting that free sandwich. And we just end up going to get that free sandwich. It just hardwired into us. You know, we want to be rewarded. And so they are constantly creating these programs to keep us rewarded. And so you have really two programs out there. You get the hotel programs and the airline programs. The hotel programs are very straightforward. Um, you, you get points when you stay and spend money at the hotel. The, and the more you stay and the more you spend, the higher up you go. Um, and then the more points and you get. You get late checkouts, free breakfast, free Wi-Fi, room upgrades, and more points per se. Um, it's very, you know, for example, you know, <clears throat> you take Marriott, you know, at 75 nights, you become a titanium member. Right, that's it. You just got to stay seventy-five nights. It's no like, you know, if if that night is on a Monday at five, it's worth like half a night. It's one night is one night. It's very straightforward. It's very easy. Um, it's the airline programs that are paying the butt because you know with airline programs you get upgrades, priority boarding, check-in, lounge access, uh, dedicated um, customer care lines, and then the more you fly, the higher your status, the more points and miles you get. But one flight, one mile doesn't eat equal one point, right? Depending on the fare class you buy, your flight might only be worth half as many points. You know, I could, if I buy one, like let's say, an, keep it simple, an A fare, right? And one mile is one point back to me and Leah gets a B fare, right? But she doesn't really know it. And then it's only half as, you know, half because it's a discounted fare. She gets half as many points. So like we can both go from LA to New York and I could walk away with say 3000 points and she walks away as 15 because she bought a B fare, had no idea it was a B fare. And now she's like, what the hell? Right. But then she's like, and then Erica happens to buy her ticket through Turkish Airways. And, but be, and because it's coded as a Turkish ticket, it's only worth you know, a quarter of it, right? So and she doesn't know that either. And so the airlines are very much more complex systems because they have so many different fare classes. And depending on the airline you fly, if it's a partner airline, the fare class, and what the code is, you are going to find so much variety. So they are a pain in the butt and they are very confusing. And that's a whole PowerPoint in itself. Uh, it's a whole presentation that I'm not going to go into. Uh, I probably went into so much depth already. I have you much, have you very confused. So we'll just move on. But um, know that it's not always as straightforward as with the hotel points, but the perks are pretty straightforward. And so when you're thinking about, um, a lot of people are saying, you know, keep it basic. I, I have to get my first card, you know, where do I start? That's where I really want to get into now. And I think it's, for me, the most important thing is, is always just starting to like, what do you want to do? Because there's hundreds of credit cards out there. Um, I get like 25. Erica was just saying on this phone call before we got on, she's got 21. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot out there. 
And there's a lot for anything you want. You can get cash back, you can get hotel cards, you can get um, Disney ones, cruise ones, uh, airline ones, you know, anything and everywhere what you want. And so it's really important just to think about like, what, what do I want? You know, do you just care about domestic flights? Are, are you loyal to one brand? Are you looking for cash? Do you, are you trying to take your family to Disneyland? Um, are you looking to find, you know, do you really just want to fly uh, Japan Airlines first class? Uh, like what is the one thing you want? And so, you know, write down your goal because that's the first thing uh, you got to do is you got to like write down your goal. And then you can go, okay, what cards get me to that goal, right? If I want to fly, you know, if I want to go to Europe in Lufthansa first class, okay, I like, what cards get me there? And so, um, uh, I'm going to make a note for another slide for more examples. Um, but you would then, you know, for in this example, like Lufthansa, you look up Lufthansa and you go, okay, well, they partner with United. I can get the United credit cards as well as the Chase credit cards. Because Chase cards transfer to United. Trans those points, Chase points, can go to United. So I can just build up United points and then use United points to get Lufthansa flights. Or if you're just like, I want to go to Fiji and I want to stay in this amazing bungalow and um, I really don't care. Well, you know, who has the best bungalows? All the hotels. So I would look up what cards have the biggest bonuses and just get that, right? Like Hilton right now has great bonuses. I would just go get a bunch of Hilton cards, get all those points, cash them in for that hotel stay in Fiji. And so, you know, you kind of just have to start with your goal and then work to see what cards get you that goal. And it does take some figuring out because you kind of have to work backwards. And I can't put on all the possible iterations um, of combinations you can get to your goal. But I do have a, a thing at the end to help you. So let's just start with saying the first thing is you want your, you got to write down your goal. The second thing you want to do is um, then you want to pick the cards, right? So the key things you want to look for when picking a credit card is what has the biggest sign up bonus right at the moment. Um, Cause you always want to get the biggest bonus as you can. Um, Second, you want to look for category spends. You, you never want to get a card that only does one for one. Let's say you need 100,000 points to go fly that Lufthansa first class. Well, if your card only gives you one point per dollar spent, you got to spend $100,000 to get that flight. That's fucking crazy, right? Who's got 100 grand to spend? If you had 100 grand to spend, you wouldn't be on this call, you would just buy the flight, right? So you always wanna get a card that gives you, you know, two, three, four, five points per dollar spent. Um, because, so you can lower the amount of money you have to put on your card to get to the points. And we'll talk about how to put, how to get points and not spend, you know, $50,000 for a flight. You just, 50,000 bucks just to get a free flight. Uh, you also want to look um, for low minimum spending, right? A lot of cards are like, yeah, you can get 150,000 points, but you gotta spend 10K to do it. And I, that's, you know, that's too much. I don't get 10K, right? Um, so you, I always kind of look for points that allow you to spend two to $3,000 within a three to six month period, because that is manageable for most of us. But additionally, even if it's not, like, not something you normally would spend, there are ways to like manufacture spending that I will get into. 
Um, but it, it allows you to only have to manufacture a small amount of spending. Especially if you're starting off, you don't want to um, kind of go overboard. There are a lot of people who are like, I'm going to go buy $10,000 worth of gift cards. And then you realize like, it's actually a lot more complicated to get rid of these gift cards and pay off your bill and you're not going to get it done in time. And now you're stuck with $10,000 worth of gift cards. You can't do. I do know that people who, that has happened to, and it's not fun. And a lot of people, what happens is they bite off a lot more. They can, can chew when they start. So it's, I always recommend start it's really slowly because it is kind of complicated if you jump into the deep end. So it's better just to start with one goal, one or two cards and, and just a few things at once and then build up to 21 cards over time. Oh, I got my tea at Starbucks. To go, of course. Um, and you know, these are some of the things that I've just got this slide to go before. Um, so one thing I will mention is, this is the first time I've done this PowerPoint specifically. So I might, as we go, be like, oh, actually this slide would be better um, in advance. But as you can see, I've collected some serious points and miles over the years. And I, this is what I'm here to help you do too. Uh, and so I wanna address this question right now, annual fees. Um, I have this card right here. If I can find it in my pocket, maybe I don't have it anymore. But yeah, here it is. I'm not gonna show you my credit card number, but this card right here. Who's got the Chase Sapphire Reserve? Right in the thing. This is my favorite card. But it also is 550 bucks a year annual fee. Now, it's a crazy amount of money on a card. Now, I think this card's worth it because I get $300 back in travel credit. So that means I'm only actually paying 250 bucks, but I get 15% off my lifts and I spend a ton of money on lift per year. So actually I probably save more than it costs me. But when you're thinking about getting your first card, don't worry about the annual fee because the bonus that you'll get is always going to be worth the annual fee in that first year, even if it's 550 bucks, right? Because think about it, this card right now comes with about 60,000 points when you sign up for it. So you're basically paying 550 bucks for 60,000 points. Well, actually, let's say you use the travel credit, you don't use Lyft, you're paying 250 bucks for 60,000 points. 60,000 points can get you like two, three flights to Europe. So you're basically paying two, 250 bucks for two, maybe three, depending on um, if there's a special deal, round trip flights to Europe. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good deal. Even in the age of Scott's cheap flights, still a pretty good deal, right? Or I can fly business class, then I'm paying 250 bucks for business class. So in the first year, the, the annual fee isn't something you should really consider um, as like, it shouldn't keep you away from getting a card in that first year. In the second year, you can think about, do you actually get more benefits? Um, but we, I know a lot of people who are like, I refuse to get an annual fee. And that's, that's not a great way to look at it um, because those fees come with better rewards, better access to services and promotions, and the cards generally have better travel insurance and um, buyer protection. And, you know, a lot of credit cards, you know, if something happens, like you buy something and something happens, you can return it for free within 90 days. So those fees do work, um, especially in the first year. And so don't think this fee is just a way for the cards to credit cards to get something for nothing. If you use your card correctly, you're gonna actually make out pretty good on it. Um, Chase actually started, was actually losing money on this card because too many people were signing up and using the benefits the right way and paying their bills off on time. So they actually had, it took like a, a multi-million dollar like loss on this card. It's part of the reason they, they changed, they increased the price because People were just using it smartly. 
So if you use the card correctly, the annual fee is always worth it. Okay, so and so this is some other questions people have. Will credit cards hurt my credit? My friend Gary likes to say, um, what's the point of a credit score if you're not gonna use it? You know, <clears throat> credit card, every time you sign up for any line of credit, whether that's a mortgage, uh, car loan, or a credit card, your credit score is going to drop a little bit because they're, it's just how it is. Every time there's a, uh, a credit pull, there's a ding on your credit. But that credit is not like a permanent mark. Um, it's temporary and it usually goes away within two to three months. And then what's left over is what is called, um, what's the most important thing is your credit to debt ratio. So actually the more credit you have, uh, the better. Because let's say I have $100,000 of credit and I use 1,000 of it a month, right? I'm using 1% of my credit. I, I look like a responsible person. I'm, you know, I'm not spending a lot. But Leo over here has $100,000 in credit and spends $95,000 of it a month. She, she looks like riskier because she's getting closer. She's spending 95% of her available credit. So to the banks, she might go over the limit. She might default, like, there's not a lot of leeway. So the more credit you have, the better it actually is for your score. And, and a credit score is meant to be used, right? You have worked hard to build up this credit score and be a financially responsible person. For what? Just to let it sit there? No. So you can get cards like this and you can get free travel. So having a, getting lots of credit cards actually over time will be better for your credit score than not getting cards. You know, the more credit lines you have, the better it is. Uh, so don't be afraid to use that score. What if you have poor credit? Um, luckily, we live in America. Oh, most of you live in America because this conversation is really geared toward Americans. Um, but, you know, these are the five things I would do to rebuild your credit score. Um, number three and four being the most important, um, getting a secure card can really build your credit really quickly and adding uh, somebody that you trust to be an authorized user on your account uh, that has good credit, uh, their good score will sort of go on to you and help you get um, credit quicker. So these are the five things I would do. Uh, I love Discover Capital One uh, for these. You know, they offer a lot of um, cards to low people with low credit scores and that can really help you build up your credit score really quickly. It can only, you know, you can rebuild your credit score within a year or two if you're really smart about it. All right, so step one, you came up with a goal. Step two, you got a credit card. And I know uh, I didn't actually list my favorite credit cards, that comes out the end, uh, but I just kind of want to walk you through this mental process. Now you got to earn those points, right? Well, if you're like me, you got a card that, um, or maybe you got this card. There's another Chase card. Oh, that had my numbers on it. Hope no one screenshot of that. All right, that was a, I'm not gonna show anymore. I have like 10 on me at the moment. Um, you got a card, um, you're getting, you know, two to three, five points per dollar spent. So I always like to maximize those points. For example, if I have a card that gives me, like the ink card I just had, five points at like an office supply store, what I will do is I will go buy gift cards at that store and then spend the gift card in, instead of using my credit card. Let's say, you, you know, because, or you get a card that is six points at grocery stores, right? So rather than get two points or three points, I just got five points. And so I, I like to sort of 
I buy a lot of gift cards, you know, just because I would spend them anyway. So that, you know, when I'm at the grocery store, I go you know, buy my groceries and I add in like a $500 gift card. Um, just so I can get, say, six points. So because rather than get 500 points when I went out, whatever, I've been getting six points. So I got, you know, 3,000 points. And I would spend the money as I normally would. I would just spend the gift card instead of my credit card. So here are like two examples um, of how I would do that. Um, you know, because the Chase Inc., you know, outside of certain bonuses, I'm only getting one point. But since I bought the gift point card, I'm getting five points. Um, you always want to try to maximize your bonus points. I, it's very handy to write down your cards and what the bonus points is in the beginning so that like if you're out shopping and you're like, what card do I use right now? You can have like your little cheat sheet and be like, okay, this is a restaurant. I need to use my Chase Sapphire Reserve. I'm gonna get three points here. Or this is a grocery store. I'm gonna get my you know, Amex every day because I'm gonna get six points. And so have a little cheat sheet can really help uh, when you're starting and you don't have this all swishing around your head like I do. Always use airline shopping portals. Um, two websites are, that are very good to keep track are Ed Reward and Cashback Monitor. So whenever I buy something, you have a couple options. You can just go online and shop or you can go in person and shop. And then you get one point per dollar spent. Keep it really simple. Or you can go to a brand's shopping portal that has worked out a deal with that retailer so that you get not only the points on your credit card, but also points for that airline or Chase has it or American Express has it or Hilton has it, they all have them. Um, and then you get bonus points. So let's say I, I need to go get some clothes and I go to the Gap. I can go into the Gap and spend a hundred bucks and walk out with a hundred points on my credit card. Or I can go through Delta's shopping portal, buy the clothes online, get the hundred points on my credit card, plus an extra 300 Delta points, um, cause you know, three X per dollar spent, they're having a deal and then boom. Now I've gotten 400 points for my $100 rather than 100 points. So these shopping portals are a great way to amplify your points real quickly. And since the deals are always changing, using every ward or cashback monitor, you can just go to their website, type in the merchant you are looking for and see who's offering the best bonus at the moment that you need. And then you just go through that portal. Um, and so, I mean, I ended up doing all my shopping online because of this. Um, also, you know, malls are closed right now and nobody wants to go in person shopping. Uh, but this is a great way again, you know, to get sometimes up to 10 points per dollar spent um, on your everyday spending, right? Again, you know, if you need 50,000 points for um, a flight, you don't want to spend $50,000. But if you can spend, you know, only 10% of that, that makes it a lot easier to get there, right? You know, you get, you know, you're, you're trying to milk the point system as much as possible. And these shopping portals are a way to do it. So is the dining program. So all every loyalty program offers you dining rewards when you eat out. It's, it's not talked about often. Most people don't, people kind of know the shopping and portals exist, but oddly enough, people don't know about the dining network. All you got to do is you can only use one company. So, um, and you can use one credit card, but I mean, they all have the same. So, I mean, I'm registered to Delta because I'm, I love Delta more than any other airline. But all you do is you just sign up through this link. Um, at rewardsnetwork.com, sign up, you register your credit card, you pick the company you want the points to go to, and you just eat out like you normally would. And you get bonus points for that too. 
right? So there's all these ways to get bonus points rather than thinking, oh, I'm not going to spend $50,000. Like, what's the point? You know, no, it's, just, it's all about bonus points. Bonus points make the world go round. Other ways to get points, take surveys. Um, every little bit counts. You can just get surveys, you know, when you watch Netflix, I take out my iPad, I'm signed up with these three companies and I just, just fill out some stupid surveys and, you know, it doesn't add up to a lot of points per month. You know, it's only a couple of thousand, but, you know, you do it every month. Suddenly at the end of the year, you've gotten a free flight. I mean, what else are you going to do? I mean, I guess you can pay attention to the show on Netflix, but, you know, multitasking. Um, and then you can also pay, if you're in the U.S., you, you, you can pay your taxes online uh, with a credit card. Now, there's a fee for this, but I like to time my a new card for this. So I purposely underpay my taxes throughout the year so that when it comes time to pay my taxes, I have a tax bill that I can pay, obviously, um, and I get a new card. I find the card with the biggest freaking bonus that I can, right? And let's say, you know, for a $10,000 tax bill, 1.8%, um, that's 188 bucks, I can get, get two cards, 50,000 points each, for, uh, I can now get 110,000 points for $188, right? What can I redeem 110,000 points for? I can go to Japan first class for that. Um, not bad, 180 bucks for a first class flight. I will take it. Plus, why should I give the government an interest-free loan throughout the year? I know we all love to get our tax bill. It's like free money, but I would rather underpay and get more points in April than give the government an interest-free loan because I want my money. It's my money. Um, but that's another thing. If you ever get stuck with the tax bill, pay it online. Get a card to time it with the bonus. So I never do this with just um, a, an existing card because then you're just paying a fee, right? You're, you just, you're not getting any benefit from it. You're not getting any bonus points. Remember I said this is all about bonus points. So time, your time a new card with your tax bill and you can get a bunch of points. All right, let's talk about manufacturer spending. Manufacturer spending is how you use your credit card to basically print money. In this case, points, All right? Your credit card, you spend money on your card, you pay it off. And in the process of doing that, you get points. But let's say you don't spend a lot of money per month. Let's also say that um, you just can't meet the minimum spending requirement. What do you do? Well, there's a couple of things that can be done. You can buy gift cards. You can buy prepaid debit cards. You can pay your rent online. Um, you can use Kiva and you can fund bank accounts. Now, mental note for myself and Erica is to put some resources here. Um, so I'm gonna type them in. Um, <clears throat> you buy gift cards, uh, how you do this. Um, and at the end, I'll, I'll have, there's only so much you can fit on the slide. Basically what you do is you go to CVS or, or someplace, um, you buy a prepaid gift card um, and you can sell them online. And then you take the money from the sale and you pay off your bill. Or you can buy a prepaid debit card, take that debit card, buy a money order, take the money order to your bank, deposit the money order, pay off your credit card. Um, you can use sites like Plastic to pay your rent online. Um, a lot of people I know use Kiva, which um, is a, a micro loan organization um, that, you know, I think it's like a 97% repay uh, 
you know, so if you can have, like, if you have a, you can, if you have some extra cash that you can sort of, you know, put away for a long term, like you don't, you don't need the money back now. Fund with Kiva. I love it. Um, or you can fund bank accounts. You can actually fund your bank account with the credit card. It does exist. Um, and um, oh, credit.com. If you go to that website right there, they have the latest list of bank accounts that you can fund. So there are ways to do this. And sorry, I'm, and another way I like to like do that I don't really tell a lot of people about, and I don't want to put it in the slide. But if you live in the U.S., and I learned this over uh, COVID, poker websites online will allow you to fund with a credit card. It's true, and they won't even charge a fee for it. Um, and then they will deposit that money back into your bank account. So you can, there's one called Global Poker. It's a really thing, and it's actually not illegal. I actually looked this up because uh, I was like, how is this illegal? Because online, po online poker, it's, it's yeah, anyways. Um, yeah, so another way to generate income is to just sign up for one of these online poker websites, drop in a bunch of money, take the money out. Um, but, you know, so there are ways out there for you to generate money, generate an extra money and minimum, meet the minimum spending requirements without having to spend more money, right? Like, you know, if, you do, if you're not spending a lot of money, you're not gonna generate a lot of points, but there are ways to sort of use your credit card to cycle through money legally, this is all very legal, um, to, increase your spending you know i'm always buying gift cards and then money orders um i pay my rent online um and um i have fun bank accounts and do the poker stuff you know it's sort of like you're sort of legally laundering money i guess you're not laundering money as beck says because but you're just like i guess you're in a way i don't know um you know, you're, you're laundering points, all right? You're not laundering money, you're laundering points. Um, somebody asked, uh, will there be re added resources? Yes, at the end, um, we'll have a link where you can get more resources. All right, um, step four, you get all these points, you gotta use it. Um, a couple of tips I wanna give you um, again, this is sort of like the basic thing, uh, and I want to be sure I, I have, oh my God, it's 1245 already? Jesus. Um, all right. Uh, I got to go. Let me give you some tips here. I'm glad we're at the end. Um, how do you decide to use points? Oh God, I feel like I'm not going to get into this. All right. Uh, definitely, we'll talk about redeeming your points. At a, another call. Um, I, I want to take all your questions. Um, so really, I'll give you one tip about re using your points. First, never use your points um, from the bank, right? If you have Chase points or Capital One points or whatever, don't, don't just like go onto their booking portal and redeem them like you would cash. You're gonna get, it's gonna cost you a lot more um, in terms of points, right? Because for them, one point is usually one penny. Uh, so, you know, a $1,000 flight is, is like 100,000, no, it's, it's 10,000 points. Does that make, you know, it's 100,000 points. Sorry, I'm not good at math. Um, so, but a thousand, but a hundred thousand points can get you multiple thousand dollar flights. Um, so never ever just redeem for cash. Always transfer to a card, to an airline company or travel company. Um, 
and then you do all this stuff. Um, so step by step, get your finances in order, determine your goal, get the cards that meet your criteria, hit your minimum spending, redeem, book. This is the short end of it. Um, Oh yeah, crypto sites are another way to, to fund. Um, yeah, okay, so I know this is all hard to understand. Um, I tried to cover a lot. I didn't realize we were already 45 minutes deep. It's good to know for the next time we do this. Um, but, you know, there's so much around this stuff, right? I mean, look, you can buy cryptocurrency, um, you know, is another way to do it. I mean, you can go as basic or as complex as you want. But, but the real thing you, you want to think about is coming up with your goal and coming up with the cards to help you to meet that goal and always making sure you're getting bonus miles. Never leave miles on the table. Redemptions, all that stuff can be worked out later. The first step is really, you know, coming up with your goal and getting the cards that get you there. Um, it's amazing the amount of people who are like, oh, I just got this card. When it's not the best card for their goal, right? I mean, someone could be like, yeah, I get this Capital One card and I'm, I'm you know, I'm just going to use it for, you know, for hotels. And like, well, actually, you know, a combination is much better to get a hotel card. Um, you know, somebody that wants, you know, is like, oh, uh, I love flying Southwest, but they don't have a Southwest card, you know, so, uh, or they want to go to Disney and they're not using the Disney card. Um, you know, they're putting all their stuff on, you know, a United card, you know, it's, it's very complicated. Um, <laughs> Okay, so two things. Um, I got to share my screen, but also um, one, uh, we have this, I have this guide here uh, that you can get. Um, it's a detailed 142 page guide um, to travel hacking. Um, and it comes, I, you know, I go into deep, like, a lot, a lot more detail on this. Uh, and if you get the book, it's $9.99. I will personally coach you um, and answer all your questions over email. If you can't do it on email, I, you can actually give me a phone call. I will talk to you over the phone. Um, but if you don't want that, I'll give you a free option too. Ignore my calendar, folks. Um, Hold on, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen for one second. I'm gonna give you, uh, where is this? Sorry, I'm gonna give you also a free option too. I decided to add it in. Uh, I can never forget the thing I want, wait, 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 wait. but. Yes, uh, I do calendar relaxation into my time. While I find this uh, uh, out here, um, you know, it, it, it's really easy to let the day go away. So I find that if I don't schedule in like reading, like my fun time, I will kind of forget about it. Um, so I actually learned this trick from a friend. Um, like, count, I, I, I calendar everything. This is not working. Um, okay, here we go. Sorry, this web is being a little slow. Uh, is it frozen on my calendar or is it just a blank screen? It's, I think it's, it's still on your calendar. <laughs> I thought I turned, <laughs> turned it off. Okay, well. Do you want to stop screen share and we no, can I'm, write it I, in the chat? I, I get it. I'm good. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> All right. All right. So everyone back to this book here. 
this book, 142 pages, it goes into everything I've talked about in, in way more detail. Um, but um, if you're not ready for the book and you still want to do it, there's a mini free guide we have in this link I just dropped into the chat. Um, it's like 20 pages and it kind of goes into a little bit more depth. Um, there's only so much I can talk about on the slide share. Um, but um, you can get that free version too. But the, the book version comes with free coaching for me. Um, but it goes into how to redeem miles, resources, every, everything like that. And we're gonna go back to my weird calendar. Um, and if you're looking for um, my favorite credit cards, this is the link to, I just dropped that into the chat. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> I will take your questions now. So, uh, <laughs> it's a lot there. Sounds good. That was a lot of great information, Matt. We have a lot of questions. Do you have any time to stay over? Do you have a hard stop? I can stay over, yeah. Okay, great. Let's get started through a few of them. So Callie wanted to know, how do you navigate reconciling personal values with a bank or card program that may not share your own values? So for example, she's committed to supporting black owned businesses, but haven't found a bank or credit card that meets those requirements. And She's heard great things about Charles Schwab's lack of, but the company's politics don't reflect her own. So how do you navigate those discrepancies? Oh, I mean, we're just going right off the bat here, aren't we? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, <clears throat> that's a, uh, a question you have to make for yourself, right? Like, okay, I mean, yeah, I think all banks suck. Like they're not out to help me out, right? I mean, none of them are like any corporate bank. I mean, they're all terrible. I mean, I'm once I we pay off the loans we got from for COVID related. I'm getting the heck out of Bank of America and moving to a local bank. Um, so, but for me, I I I don't really think about it that much. Um, because I don't think they have my interests to begin with, right? You know, there's, if I want to do travel hacking, I have to be involved with the big banks, but I don't, I know they're a terrible organization. So I like, I only get the cards. Like I don't have stuff with Chase. Um, you know, I don't, I don't casually bank with these other companies. Um, I just, have to get the credit card. And so, and a lot of small banks don't offer cre like credit cards, right? I mean, you can get debit cards, right? Like my, I'm moving to this bank, you know, it's Austin, it's local, super nice people. You can't get a credit card from them. I can get a debit card, but it might not be able to get a credit card. And so, um, I, you know, at some point, if you're gonna deal with the big banks, you just need to accept that they're just going to be terrible. I mean, if we have a car and we have go get gasoline, none of those companies are good, but we need gas in our car, right? Um, I, I, so this is, there's no easy answer. This is only the answer that you, you deal with, right? Thank you for that. Uh, don't worry, every question after that will be much easier. <laughs> that was the first question in the chat. So I was like, wow, okay, Callie coming right out the gate. So Scott would like to know, is there a list or website that shows which cards transfer to other cards? For example, like Chase to United, et cetera. Yeah, <clears throat> so um, right to, um, like when you sign up for a card, they'll show you their transfer partners, right? So in the guy that we have, I mean, I list them too, but you, know, you can just go to the Chase's website and they'll list all the airlines, hotels, and, and other travel partners that they have. Um, same with American Express. Uh, American Express, Chase, Citibank, and Capital One have transferable partners. So you can go to their website and you can get, just see the whole list right there. Um, and so, you know, if, 
for example, I really don't have a lot of city cards because I don't like their transfer partners because I just tend not to fly those airlines. Um, but some people do, right? Uh, same with Capital One, right? Um, so depending on your, your preferred partners, you might pick a different company, but you can find them on their website. But. All right, thank you for that. Okay, so Shannon would like to know, how do you consolidate points? Um, she saw that as a step, assuming it means between different cards. So <clears throat> you cannot consolidate points between different, between banks or airlines, right? So you can't take United points and like stick them in American Airlines, right? Or Lufthansa. And you can't take your Chase points and you can't put them to Capital One. But what I mean by consolidate points is taking your um, points from, let's say, your Chase card. Let's say you have Chase, American Express, and British Airways. Well, Chase, and, you know, in this situation, I would say, okay, I'm looking to book an American Airlines flight, I can do that through British Airways. So I'll move some Chase points to British Airways and my American Express points to British Airways and consolidate everything into that one company. So it's just taking stock of where you have your point balances and seeing how you can sort of squish them together into one travel company. You can, you know, this is also a reason why I don't recommend starting off with a lot of cards in the beginning because then you have points everywhere you have like a little here a little there a little there but a little a few points don't get you a long way you need a lot of points so just starting with two or three and building up your balances that way before you start branching out into these smaller ones right great so eric would like to know would you recommend sticking with the same credit card company for all of your different cards? So for example, Eric has multiple Amex cards, but could get the Delta Amex or Marriott Amex, or should they look at other companies and see if there are better options? I would always look at every company, right? I mean, in a way you want all the, every card ever, right? Um, but again, I think this goes back to looking at, uh, your your needs right you know so like you could get the delta cards but do you need the points right now and additionally they're not really offering a good bonus right now so why get the, why get those cards now if there's a better offer um and and i would always recommend people starting off with chase because chase has this rule called 5.4 meaning if you've gotten more than five cards in the in the last rolling 24 month period chase won't give you a new card so it's better to get all the chase cards first so you can, you know you're gonna be, be below that limit and then moving on to Amex or Capital One or anyone else um, because they don't have that restriction. So, but I, I don't limit myself. I have Amex, I have Chase, um, I have Capital One, um, you know, so get the card that meets your goal and uh, has a great bonus. All right. Get the card that meets your goal and ha has a great bonus. Good tip. So next question from Shu Azim. I've heard banks have restrictions against gaining points using the laundering methods like money orders and gift cards. Is that the case or is that a bank scare tactic? Yeah. So the gift cards and all that stuff is not a bank thing in the sense that like, if I go to Walmart or Staples and I buy $10,000 worth of gift cards, they're not gonna be like, oh, you bought $10,000 worth of gift cards, you're out. Um, you know, it's the, what, they, what they're really looking for under the guise of money laundering is, is you know, people who do like tens and $20,000 you know, like all the time, right? Like my friend got denied like was told he, he was he could no longer get new chase cards because he was doing like fifty thousand bucks a month and then you know at that point then you kind of look like you're laundering money right but if you're just doing a couple of grand a month 
you know, it's not a big deal. The thing is that um, what what the restrictions came in is that um, places like Walmart and Target restricted people's ability to buy gift cards with credit cards um, or redeem or like change those debit cards into um, money orders. So it's, it's a lot more localized now, you know, maybe your supermarket chain allows it and mine doesn't. Um, maybe your Walmart allows it, but mine doesn't. So you really have to just kind of look to see what's in your area <clears throat> rather than you know, sort of blanket statements. But it's really, if you start putting like 50 grand on your Chase card a month and gift cards, they're gonna review your account. And the, the, then that's when you kind of get into like, mm, you might be laundering money. <laughs> Yeah. So if they can't do it in your state, just drive over to the next state and see if you can do it. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. So Amy would like to know what happens when you don't need a card anymore and you don't want to pay the $550 fee. So you have a couple of options here. Um, if you don't want to pay the fee anymore, you can obviously cancel the card. Uh, or there's two ways that can you can do that, you know, sort of preserve your credit score is a, you can ask them if they have a no fee or a low fee version of that card. You can always downgrade. Or B, if you have another card in that bank's family, let's say, you know, you have a Chase card um, and you have the Chase Sapphire, but you don't want to pay the five fifty anymore. Um, you can ask them to ch shift that credit line to the other card. So your total credit limit doesn't change, right? You're not, you're not taking a drop. You're just moving this over here. So everything still remains the same. So I always use one of those two tactics. Additionally, you can also say like, well, you know, I'm not really using the card a lot. Um, I think I'm gonna cancel it. They will try to keep you around. And so you can sort of say, well, maybe, maybe if you give me the next year free, I might use it a little more. Um, so oftentimes they'll waive the second year and you can just do that. So one of those three options besides canceling will usually work out in your favor. But oftentimes I just move the credit line to a different card and then, you know, sure. that, that preserves a fee. Okay. So when you cancel the card, does it hurt your credit score? You lower your credit to debt utilization. So mm -hmm. there, you know, depending on how much of a drop that is, it can temporarily lower your score. Okay. All right. Um, I have a side note here from Steven saying that the 524 rule is for all cards with any company, not just five chase cards in 24 months. I didn't know about this rule. Yeah. Uh, no. 524 is specifically referred to as Chase as rule. Other companies do have similar rules, but they are not as strict as Chase, nor do they apply to their entire suite of cards. Um, so Amex, for example, like you can, like Chase is like, if you got five cards in any company in the world, we're going to restrict you. With you know, Bank of America, it's like if you got a Bank of America card within that 24 month, you're not looking at Chase, right? So there are restrictions through companies, but they aren't as global and as draconian as Chase's 524. Okay. All right. Do you have time for three more questions, Matt? Sure. Okay. So Rachel Park wants to know if you have any tips for people in the UK or do you know of any UK specific cards or hacks? Uh, check out the website, Head for Points. Right. Headforpoints.com. That is the best UK website. Head for Points. Okay. And Doug has a question. Uh, actually, let's go to Kim's question first. Um, you discussed using a credit card to buy gift cards at Staples. So do you buy Staples gift cards or like Visa gift cards at Staples or does it matter? Yeah, you can have two options. You can buy a gift card 
or a, a prepaid debit card. So just keep the two things in mind. Um, I'm talking about prepaid debit cards, so I just buy the Visa. You want to, you want to buy a PIN-enabled Visa credit card. Because that means you can use it anywhere, not just Staples, correct? Correct. And it acts like, because it's pin enabled, it acts like a debit card. And those are the ones you can then turn into money orders. Yes. Because I don't know who wants $2,000 at Staples to spend. <laughs> okay. Um, so last question, Doug, when we emerge from COVID, do you think the cost of travel will drop to generate bookings or do you think costs will remain steady or even increase because of pent up demand? Say that again. Um, when we, Doug wants to know when we emerge from COVID, do you think the cost of travel will drop to generate bookings or will costs remain steady or even increase because of demand? I think costs will drop in the beginning to get people out and then it, they'll go up. People need cash now. They're going to want that now. Uh, and then once that happens, they'll, um, they will um, start raising prices. Yep. That sounds about right. Okay, Matt, thank you so much, you guys. Um, if we didn't get to your question for whatever reason. Uh, you can always, I just dropped it in the chat. You can always write to Matt at matt at nomadicmatt.com with any of your unanswered questions. We don't want to go, we can't go too far over time today. So again, thank you for all of your tips and everyone. Thank you for your questions. I just have a few closing announcements before we get going. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. All right. So we do have a few events coming up. They're all at the nomadicnetwork.com forward slash events. In fact, we even have one tonight at 6 p.m. Pacific time. I'm in LA, so I'm the West Coast. It's with Rick. It's counting countries. Exactly how many countries are there? We had Rick come on at the onset of our virtual events with the Nomadic Network, and now he's coming back to discuss the ins and outs and how many countries really are there. So as you can see, we have a bunch of events uh, lined up for next week. We have Cuba by Talek, which will be awesome. Moving to France, Stephen is coming back and doing a round two because it was such a popular topic that he wants to do a Ask Me Anything. And then we have Ava as well, what it's like to teach English and live in South Korea. And Erica will also donate her expertise to that um, event. So as you all know, um, Nomadic Network, you know, a lot of work goes into creating these events and they are all free for you guys. And we love putting these on, but in order to make sure these keep going and if you'd love to support the community, we have a Patreon. So you can go ahead and scan that and you get all of the benefits listed here with it. You get these event replays. So if you want to watch this one again, personal stories that Matt will share out. Um, you get to vote on content that, that gets created, live Q and A's, free signed books, free guides, never before seen photos. So we'd appreciate your support. Um, and there's different levels you can join at as well, which is always nice. Or if you can't do that, a one-time donation via PayPal, which is on the right side of the screen here. And you can go ahead and scan that. And we, we love putting these events on for you guys. So anything, would be appreciated. So, like I said, thank you, Matt, again, for this informative presentation. I hope you guys got something out of it. Yeah, oh, you can yeah. just hold your phone up to the QR code and it doesn't. <laughs> the best. I have a newfound love, re-love for QR codes. They're being used so much recently, so. Again, thank you all for being here. We had, we learned so much, I learned so much. Matt, thank you again for your time. And thank you all for making this community what it is. And we will see you on the next one, hopefully tonight. Thanks everyone for coming. Bye everyone. Thank you.